Okay, and now we've started recording. Derp, Yay! Derp, 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 derp. So I'm going to go back to shooting this Reaper on Rannoch. Yep. Spoilers. Pix- Pixie's finally destroying some actual Reaper with her space satellite laser beam. Oh, shit. So as you can hear, I'm Sen. I'm Pixie. And I'm Iris, yeah. <laughs> Right, and you're listening to a uh, date. Today is April 4th, 2012. I was going to say the 5th. Glad I checked. So to the April... Uh, I thought you were asking for a date. I was like... <laughs> no. No, my co-host gets free food when she's here. So yeah, it's a thing. It's nerd talk. Tonight we're talking about The Hunger Games. And also Indian food. We're discussing my <laughs> cooking? Really? I, I don't think that's very interesting, but if we need to... Cooking Indian food. Buy a bottle of Indian food sauce. Pour on chicken. Ta-da! <laughs> We're also discussing very loud emergency vehicles in the background. <laughs> right. I, I do kind of live on a road that's like between that's a fire station and a hospital. So And it's also the main road. It, it's one of the main roads in my town. So. And what's uh, worse is that the hospital is on fire and the fire station. station. Staring contest with a reaper. Yep, this is the part of the game where Shepard has a staring contest with a reaper, to, reaper as it charges its And they're its playing laser, laser chicken. Right. Whose laser fires first? That's right. Shepherds did. I totally died on the se- that very started. last slow-mo sequence my first time in that battle. Wait, how? The, the Reaper's <laughs> laser fired first. Oh, okay, that was funny. It it just had a glitch where it was loading the next cutscene, and so Shepard would just reappeared, facing the rock away from the <laughs> Reaper, and then a moment later it got showered with artillery fire from space. Just cool like, ladies, don't look at explosions. We just needed some emphasis that Shepard was so uh, brave, she turned around. <laughs> they blow things up Fem and Shep. then walk away. Fem Shep for the win, guys. Yeah, I will say this is probably one of the coolest sequences in the game. Shepard knows how to give a hell of a speech, and Jennifer Hale is the best, and if you say otherwise, I will fight you. I don't know the name of Man Shep, so I can't defend him even if I wanted to. I'm kind of curious as to what this is, but... Do it. Well, but the, I don't want to lose here's the thing. this option. You don't. The choices on the left in Mass Effect are always just extra dialogue rather than confirming anything. It's the choices on the right that move the conversation forward. Oh, that's you can always well. make the conversations on the left without a problem. It seems you have to get this speech. Man, I gotta watch this scene with Legion twice. Yup. So what did you think of this scene, Pyro? Uh, the idea that Legion had to delete himself in order to upgrade all of the other Geth? I felt a little ripped off because... Well, in a variety of ways. But first, let's say... I want to know how you two had that turn out, and what decisions you made. Um, I ended up telling Legion to first upload the code, and then when Tali started begging me to stop, I uh, went with the Paragon option and rallied the fleet. Okay, well, I did not... I feel like... I don't remember not having the Paragon option available, but I did not see a Paragon Renegade option. Maybe so it was. How did your game go? I said upload, 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 um, and the Quarians are extinct, and Tally committed suicide. What? Yes. There is like during your game, you didn't get Tally in your party. She killed herself. Correct. Wow. Yeah, I guess if you don't have the Paragon points, you can't interrupt with a "Hey, you should stop, otherwise they will wipe you out." Yeah, because the way my game totally went, the way I directed Pixies to go, um, you end up telling Legion to upload the code. You tell him to upload the code, and then while he's doing it, you advise the Quarians, stop fighting. I advised the Quarians to pull back, and Douchey McDoucherson was like, nah, it's fine, keep attacking. And Tally yeah, was like, please fall put... back. And then Douchey McDoucherson was like, you have... nah. No, you have an an option there if you have the Paragon points to tell them not to. Right. Yeah, Shepard has the option to say, hold on, I'm begging you, don't do this. Just sit there for a minute and you'll see they won't shoot you. Right. You'd you'd think the momentary shock of full self-awareness would stop most people from fighting. 
Yeah. That... Like, holy crap, I have independent thoughts. Back to shooting. <laughs> so no, you can play out the scene totally where you get both sides to join your forces, and Rannoch becomes a bright, happy rainbow sanctuary. Yeah, I totally did not get that. And I don't... And Tali's talking about building a beach house. <laughs> right, instead of killing herself. How did she kill herself? Did she, like, leap off a cliff or something? She took off her mask, and then she leaped off a cliff. And there's a quick time interrupt with the Paragon, and you do the quick time interrupt, and Shepard leaps after her to try and catch her as she's falling off the cliff, but it doesn't actually do anything. What a stupid Paragon interrupt. Well, it's kind of heartbreaking, because it's like I tried, but then it didn't work. Right. I don't know if I... Yeah, Tally takes off her mask here, but just to look at the pretty sunset. Yeah. She's like, I want to see this. Wow, your Mass Effect game was a lot darker than mine. I don't remember seeing a Paragon option grayed out. Uh, maybe I didn't see it, and maybe I'm remembering wrong, but I feel like I just did not have Paragon options. I just had gray text all the way maybe through. They're, maybe they just don't have the gray, the, like show up but grayed out if you can't do them. Right. Yeah, that's weird. I because I... yeah, there's a there's a there are two options. You have the blue paragon option and the red renegade option, and then you've got the standard two on the right. I'm kind of wondering and what the renegade the red, option does. The in renegade that option was to warn the fleet. Oh, yeah, they would probably still open fire. <laughs> uh, presumably, both options actually result in the good outcome. Uh, it's just to provide an out for people who have been playing all one way or all the other way. I, right. I don't like these systems where players are punished severely for uh, playing nuanced characters who do are either Paragon or Renegade, depending on the circumstances. I, I think I've made this argument when we were playing uh, uh, The Old Republic. It really sucks. <laughs> right, because I, I tried to play that neutral Sith warrior, and then it came to the point mid-game where it was like, yeah, either you go with the option that doesn't make sense, or you're an evil bastard. You can't play the middle ground. And the results are in that there was speculation earlier on in our Old Republic time that it, for Endgame it wouldn't really matter that you have one light side or dark side tier maxed out, and the results are in that it does matter, because I totally yeah. had Endgame gear that I wanted to wear but could not because my alignment was not extreme enough. Well, your story, depending on what class you play, your story also shifts at a point depending on if you're light side or dark side. Like, as I've said, the light side Sith warrior goes under the, yeah, I got light side Jace Wilson, and my goal is to help reforge the Sith Empire. Right, but that, that's Whereas completely... Whereas if you're playing the dark side, you go, I got dark side Jace Wilson, and my goal is to take control of the Sith Empire. That's reasonable, because, I mean, the whole idea of the morality system is you want your choices to affect the gameplay, or you want your choices to affect the narrative. But right. that, it, that a morality system would punish you for choosing a particular narrative direction in terms of mechanical gameplay is really sucky. Actually... If I go back to the beginning of this chapter in my strategy guide, which is what I was worried about to begin with, then what are you doing with my computer? No. I was going to look up this error that we're getting. You said you didn't need a computer today. Oh. You said that. <laughs> and so since you didn't bother to set one up, you don't get one. No. Oh. Sen's being punished. Because I told you to set up half an hour ago. That's why. Ah, uh, I was busy painting. Well, you weren't paying attention. So, you can see this little war asset chart here. Right. That there's side with the Geth and side with the Corians on conditions. Okay, then. So this is the assumption I was operating on. Yeah, no, you can totally manage it so you get both. Um, I play so more awesome than the book. If you side with the Corians, you get three fleets plus an admiral. Plus, I guess, keeping Tolly. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> having Tolly commit suicide, a little dark. Whereas if you side with the Geth, you get the Geth fleet and the Geth Corps. So, getting four reset with sources versus getting two. Plus a party member. You got four resources and a party member. I, I, I kind of felt super gypped because, I mean, even laying aside that there was a take all winners option that I did not get, I, it was like, okay, Tally committed suicide and I sided with the Geth. 
sure, I made that decision and I live with it. But it's weird that it just kind of pulls it out of its butt that then Legion has to die too. I'm like, don't shouldn't I get to keep Legion? I mean, I let Tally die. Shouldn't Legion stay alive? But then he doesn't. No, see, that's there's a reason for that though, and they've established it. Yeah, Le- it Legion been... at least died for a reason. There's, there's, he sacrificed himself to give the collective, that, that was the purpose of the whole upload. That was literally what he was doing with that upload, which you told him to do. Right, no, but he He only said at 90% that, oh, I need to die to finish this. Up until 90%, he was like, oh, I can just do this upload and I'll just do the upload. And then at 90%, he's like, oh, I have to die. At 90. Yeah, there was an error when he got to 90%. So they like, they pulled oh, that out at the last minute. That's not that was not established from moment one. Well, that wasn't what he was planning on doing either when he started. That that was a sudden last second shift that Legion decided to do. Right. So I killed Tally, and then after I killed Tally, Legion died too. And I'm like, hey, I don't get. Hey, wait a minute. I was like, what you get for not having the Paragon points, I guess. I guess so. Admiral Douchebag just went a little crazier than usual and got his entire race killed. Did you have Admiral Chorus alive? Yes. Okay. So I was wondering if that might have influenced it, too. I did both of the side missions before I did it. Yes, but whether or not Chorus is alive is another matter. Right, I I did save Chorus. Uh, I I also kind of feel... By the way, guys, this is a spoiler-tastic podcast. Hopefully... I think we've beforehand. established we're always going to be a spoiler-tastic podcast. In a minute, we're going to spoil the Hunger Games. Eh, not really. really? I'll... There's not any I'm need a... to spoil to anything. I, I'm going to be forced to see it. I've heard I get to see Woody Harrelson as a drunk, which is yes. always good. I actually am concerned that he won't get to be enough of a fucked-up drunk. <laughs> no, he's... Oh, speaking, speaking of needing to watch my language, I want to run an idea by you. Okay. Eep. Uh, Pyro, you've already heard this. I'm thinking of doing another practicum with WLRA next semester. Aw, oh, hell, we're back on the air. Um, the idea I had was that we could do a recorded version, and then I could just take a disc up there and play So you're it. literally just going to sit in the studio and, and, to and play a disc? For three hours, yes. Wow. I, I'm game. I don't care. That would mean we would have to go back to some kind of, like segmented format or, or at least some kind of thing that we can i can Cut do breaks up. between and yeah right. and, that, and that we can stretch out over three hours that, that's just a matter of watching the clock all right so continuing i um, almost feel good that i don't have the quarians as war assets in my playthrough because i feel like if the quarians are so militarily inept that when I, Commander Shepard, am on the ground saying to them that, hey, the Geth are going to be upgraded again real soon, you should pull back. And they're like, nah, I don't want them in my final battle because they would make mistakes that would kill everybody else. The douchebags. They have no military right. discipline. I don't, I don't, they would be more of a hinder than a help. <laughs> Obviously, that's not true in gameplay terms, but the word you're looking for. from a narrative perspective, I don't even want you on my side for the final battle if you're this bad at fighting. Or apparently at all in the universe. Or apparently at all in the universe. The codex entry for the Quarian after you do this says that maybe one or two uh, ships escaped, so maybe the species isn't entirely extinct, but there's like a hundred individuals alive, if any. Yeah... Your universe is a much darker place than mine was at the end of the game. That's probably the only instance in which that's true. And that That's a really significant change, and the fact that Bioware would put something like that in really says something about their flexibility with the narrative here. That in one ending, Shepard proves to be the big hero and saves not only the Quarians, but the Geth. And in another one, you let either species get wiped out and possibly both of your friends die. I think it die. definitely counts as species, though, they from a biological do now. standpoint. They're a, ra- a unique race that can a reproduce race, sure, through. not a species. Well, I guess if your taxonomic definition is a species yeah. that can reproduce with each other via intercourse, then not really. 
Uh, From a taxonomy point of view, it's the, it's not a species. Fair enough. Race, sure. We can do, we can do race. People. But not a species. Uh, that's, oh, hey. that's the way when you determine evolutionarily. That sounds like we're... When species have diverged into different species when they started from the same base is when they can no longer mate with each other. That's that's the rule of thumb. So if geth don't um, mate, then it's hard to call them a species. Pyro, right. did you know that the uh, listen live link does not work? Uh, I guess it would. Neither does my admin page. Okay. Righto. Got a 404 error. Right, I know why that is. Fortunately, we're not broadcasting live, so it's not a super big deal. Yeah, but we're right. popping into the chat box. <laughs> For people who can't hear us. Someone was going to be there. Oh. Who doesn't love a one-sided conversation? All right, well, that uh, I'll go get that fixed, but that'll take a bunch of work. Right. So, continuing. Um, I don't know. Are we ready for movie time? Sure. It's movie time. It's nerd talk goes to the movies. Or at least I go to the movies. I like the or Hunger Games and I want to go. I want to go, so... Yeah. The Hunger Games was a pretty good movie. And also kind of really depressing. As you would expect it to be, being about, you know, teenagers being forced to murder each other. Um, alright, so... Just a basic overview of the Hunger Games. The capital has a bunch of crazy technology. Uh, the districts are living in the 1800s, doing all of the mining and farming for the capital using hand tools. And the Hunger Games are a way to keep the districts from rebelling. And this premise, I have the same problem with it that I have with Brave New World and a lot of other dystopias, which is that they use humans for labor, even when they should totally be able to have robots doing all their labor. Because it's like... The robots are more expensive. Well, maybe. But it also seems like, even if they're using the humans as practically slaves to do their labor, wouldn't it be a lot more efficient to use dump trucks and backhoes and, you know, fork and forklifts and jackhammers to do your mining than to have people doing it with pickaxes by hand? I don't think... Again, those things are more expensive. Even if you work people 20 hours a day, you can't, you can't get the same amount of minerals out of a dude with a pickaxe as you can with a backhoe. It just doesn't work. Yeah, but you're saving yourself the effort of having to have those tools for them. And, you know, fuel to run some of those tools. But they have hovercrafts that they just fly around for no good reason. The Hunger Games yep. take place inside this giant holographic dome where, like, the sky and the walls, and it's like, this is probably like 10 acres, and the walls and sky are all a screen. And they turn the sun on and off with a little knob. They have that much technology. All of the trees have cameras in them so that they can broadcast this as a crazy television show. And yet, they don't have tractors. Then everyone's forced to watch. They, don't have, they can't just do their farming with tractors. They have to have people doing farming with hoes by hand. That's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. We are talking about so much hoes on this episode. But other than that, the teenagers murdering each other was pretty fun. Haymitch is yeah, a I... crazy drunk, like he should be. He's really oh, disheveled. Was, was, he, was he like the books? Oh, he was just like the books. He was a disheveled oh, asshole okay, drunkard. We're going. we're going right now. Let's, let's do this podcast later. Let's go. <laughs> this has been Nerd Talk for Wednesday, April 4th, 2012. I'm going to Fandango this. Apparently there's a movie in uh, in the works. That was that was literally my only contingency. Was that So, I've heard sure complaints about the movie's shaky cam. What can you tell us about that? I did not observe any shaky cam whatsoever. It all seemed very produced cinematography to me. Seems like it seemed like we had stable cam. Yes, totally. I right. I don't remember any shaky cam at all. There are a couple of scenes where you're viewing from inside the trees, and it's got, like, a fisheye lens. And... 
how did uh, the violence work, seeing as it got a PG-13 rating, where by the definition of the book, there's really no way this should have slipped in without an R? Um, there's lots of blood, lots of stabbing, lots of visceral violence. I guess... I don't... I don't know that it would have needed any more violence. And I'm a big proponent to making things R whenever possible, but I this had plenty of violence. There's lots of people getting their limbs ripped off by, you know, robo-dogs. And it's like, oh god, I'm being mauled to death by hundreds of robo-dogs. So pretty much anyone's complaint that it wasn't authentic enough was just pretty much fanboyism at work? Yep. No, I thought it was Why is it always fanboyism? Because classically it's males that are shockingly obsessed with some inane thing. I'm, I'm not saying it's not an incredibly sexist term and that it probably should be changed, but I'm just saying where it comes from. Well, I bet the statistics don't back you up for this book. I mean... Oh yeah, for, for modern literature? No way. I, I guarantee you the the fan base for teen literature is, is primarily a uh, equally gender-classified thing. In general, sort of young adult literature is regarded as being for young women and the standard rejection letter that publishers give people actually tends to say this is aimed at young boys and young boys don't read which is like hmm as someone who studies english i find that rather insulting <laughs> well it, it is pretty insulting but that's that's what publishers say and think and so probably that's the business reality and i guess it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you don't aim books at a demographic, then that demographic will tend not to read books that aren't aimed at them. And so there's even less reason right. to make books for them, and so they don't read. But, so, Hunger Games is two and a half hours long, which is really long by movie standards. But right. it didn't feel dragged out at all. I thought it was pretty tight, pretty quick. Especially when it starts with 24 people. It takes about half an hour to get to the murdering. But then, when there's 24 pretty familiar characters that they're murdering off, they're murdering them off rapid fire. Tick, tick, tick. Right. I, I hate to have to use the comparison, but, like, Battle Royale did something very similar, where, yeah, we're going to give you a couple base personality traits for all of these people, so you actually care when we kill them. Uh-huh. And so the setup does take a while, but but once it gets going, yeah, it it's pretty much one every two to three minutes until they're down to, like, the, the primary characters. There's the big, a nice cannon boom that they fire off in-universe to let the people who are fighting know that somebody died. It's, always, it's also good for keeping track as an audience member, because you're like, boom, ah, somebody died. It's like the ding of an achievement. Like, ah, okay, I should feel <laughs> satisfied now. That's rather horrible. The one thing that this probably really lost in the adaptation to the movie is that the Peta Gale Katniss love triangle, which I don't know how extensively it was explored in the first book, probably not a ton because uh, Gale is in District 12 the whole time and Peta and Katniss are in the capital the whole time, so they're not really hanging out. But it was obvious in the movie that they were alluding to it with like 30 seconds worth of shots in like two scenes and if you knew it was there you saw it but if you didn't know it was there you would completely miss it and that is something you lose by not being able to talk about the character's thoughts there's no inner monologues in movies yeah i i'm kind of getting the distinction that i am going to miss quite a bit of stuff by having not read the book that there are a lot of nods just for those people i think in this. So. i benefited a lot from knowing that those were there but i think that if you completely missed them you would not even know you were bereft i, see. I think i came into this movie with exactly the right spoiler level because i haven't read the books but i have read a lot of the mark reed's blog posts about it and I didn't remember them very specifically, but I do know how the games end. And I do know just broad outline sketches of all the characters, so I was more familiar with them than potentially I would be if the movie was just showing me them the first time. 
And I, I think I can honestly say I know one thing that would be considered a spoiler about going to see The Hunger Games. Hmm. That the main character lives because there's two sequels. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> and one of the biggest things... Actually, I- during it, I didn't feel like that was a guarantee. Well, yeah, like, you, while need, you, were you need reading, that quality suspense. While you were reading it, like, I, I didn't feel like that was, like, because there were a whole bunch of characters that I felt like it could have, the sequels could have been done from the perspective of. Uh-huh. Right. I, I just knew that she was going to survive because her name is on the back of both of the other books. And really, that's kind of something you can just infer from the, the age demographic, uh, you know, teenagers don't tend to like it when you kill off the main character. It's like, yeah, you have to have happy endings for teenagers, at least a little bit. There has to be some redemption. As, as opposed to George R. R. Martin, who needs right. to create a new cast of main characters every single book it, because he likely killed most of if them. If you're writing for 30-year-olds, then you can just, you know, kill off everybody that your audience loves and just leave them heartbroken and be like, nope, sorry, the world sucks. Right, I, Life is I, hard. I distinctly suspect that Martin has, like, just a dartboard in his writing room with all of his characters' names for each book on it, and then we'll just throw darts to decide who dies in each book. And, yeah, one of the things I was thinking most of the time that I was watching The Hunger Games is that all this is making me want to do is watch the sequels. Because, I mean, the, the first book is kind of such a microcosm compared to the third, or the second and third, which is that the, in the second and third, they take the fight to the government that is doing all these evil things and try and break the cycle. Whereas in the first right. book, you're just watching one little iteration of the cycle. And I, I've heard a lot of people say about the books that the first one is the necessity and the other two are kind of nice codas that are a bonus. But Watching the movie, I really wanted to see two and three more than I wanted to keep watching one. But yeah, I, I liked watching one a lot. It's a great movie. Good visuals, good violence, good story. Sweet. Was well, there anything to be said for the uh, the casting choices that they made? Yeah, I I was a little bit perturbed at um, the is whitewashing Hamish of the Owen cast. Wilson? I, I didn't... No. Okay. Woody Harrelson, are you fucking kidding yeah, me? Yeah, it's Woody Harrelson, dude. Okay, I, I... Right. I... I hate you a little bit right now. Oh my god. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't recognize Woody Harrelson. He hides so well. Man, if it had been Owen Wilson, that would have been so terrible. That would have been awful. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he was dressed up like... Like Owen Wilson in yeah, this movie. W- with his with his hair, it's not really surprising. But then again, at the exact same time, like, we can at least be thankful that Owen Wilson pretty much doesn't, like, appear in anything except romantic comedies and Ben Stiller movies now. Like, that's it right there. So yeah, The Hunger Games. Apparently worth seeing. Now, any good trailers attached to this one we should be looking forward to? Um, an Avengers trailer is the one that caught my eye. I don't know that it's new for this movie. It probably isn't, but Joss Whedon's Avengers is a heck of a trailer. <laughs> Hopefully the movie lives up to it. Yep. And nothing after the crests, in case you want to. How's the costuming? Costuming is really good. There's, especially since it's a fairly notable plot point, that uh, one of the uh, main characters is a costume artist, the costumes are really good. Yeah, see, this character was supposed to be, like, some. the main character was described in the book as someone with an olive complexion, and they cast a white blonde chick. Right. There was kerfuffle on the internet that people did not like uh, the girl from... Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. I don't remember the character's name. I'm calling her Zoe, but that's wrong. The girl from District 11. Da-da. They, they don't really give you names of too many people. No, they they totally. Is she I had mean, a very notable name, and she's the significant character. I have no idea what any of this is, so uh, yeah. I'll cut this part out, but I'm gonna go. Uh, it up. Wait, I I think the character you're talking about is Rue. It is we Rue. Discussed yes. it today in class. Rue is the that character. Rue, Rue was supposed to be a uh, a black person, and she was. 
And there was kerfuffle on the internet that racists didn't like that she was black. So we're getting into the, hey, why is him Noel black? Yep. Argument again? I'm Noel. Whatever. Actually, uh... Yeah. Because he's awesome, that's why. Yep. Except this is even Here's worse the than coolest the why thing is Heimdall about black movie. argument, because the argument can be made that Heimdall was a Norse god, and people tend to make right. their gods look like them, and people from Scandinavia tend to be white. And so, right. there, there is a fairly reasonable argument that Heimdall theoretically is black in the canon of actual Norse religion back in the day, but... Rue, it totally was very black in the book. It was spelled right out. Yup. So, the only so argument the against Rue being black is being that they're dumb. racists, and racists were upset, and they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> Glad we're doing this before we move on. So, I'm looking at all the other, like, nominations who could have been picked to play Katniss. White blonde chick, white blonde chick, white, white blonde, blonde chick. chick. There's a brunette, who's also a white chick. White brunette. Another white brunette. brunette. Another white brunette. Another white chick. Another white chick. Yep, it was all white chicks that were looked at for this role. Yep. What the dumb. There's Not that I have a whole lot of complaints against white chicks being one, but, I mean, really? I think we, I think we pretty well dominated the the art form for long enough. I'm gonna send you an argument about two pictures in Skype. Let's see. This is Owen. This is a picture of Owen Wilson, and this is a picture of <laughs> oh, no. Hamish as presented in the movie. <laughs> and okay, we're gonna look at this. It, it is it is not impossible to is see Owen how Wilson? I might have made that mistake. And there's the second picture of Hamish. Oh, just yeah, go no, back and forth that. between those two pictures real quick. You're crazy. Both have a screwed up nose. Actually, Woody Harrelson's nose looks a little better. I was going to say, yeah. And of course, no. I was doing this from memory, so... Not to mention... Forget this, we need to cast difference. Luke Wilson in this role. The better of the two. The more entertaining of the two. Also... WTF that style. I've heard that pretty much the the residents of the the main city, the government, are just like yeah, the see. most insane uh, fashion monstrosities that they could come up with, and that they totally the are. Real. Yeah, and right. It's part the, of the thing. They're decadent, morally bankrupt people, as represented by their crazy fashion. Right ho. I should send you a picture of the Battlemaster's beard. Well, apparently we're going to go see this this evening. I don't, can't afford to do that. So maybe we'll be discussing more about this in the future. So, there is totally going to be a Penny Arcade Adventures 3, finally. I'm finally, super psyched and, about this. And it has been dropped to 16-bit, which is kind of awesome. Yup. I'm re I'm really glad that game developers are now realizing that hey, we don't need to push graphics in every iteration of every game. Some games can be 16-bit. Not do it to make a statement, but because it's a valid form of game. And I think that's really cool. Oh, the old the the previous two Penny Arcade adventures weren't graphics monsters themselves. I mean, they were just sprite-based adventure games. Mm, they uh, were 3D rendered. No, they were absolutely not polygonal. They were... Well, okay, actually, they were. I'm wrong. No, they were, because I've, I've got it for the PlayStation 3. I've, I've played them both, and no, they did use 3D models. Okay, the cutscenes are in a are 2D comic book right. style. Yeah, those were done by Gabe. But even uh, the 3D parts of the original adventure games were not... Yeah, like, they, crazy sophisticated. They were about the level that you expect a Telltale game to be. And and the combat system, I think, was the biggest uh, appeal of those games in that it, it captured the idea of the, um, the old sprite RPGs 
while still having some action-oriented mechanics built into them. It was kind of like an, a more advanced step of what you found in Final Fantasy VIII, uh-huh. where you had to input certain commands to get the most out of your characters. And the funny thing is that actually the switch between a 3D adventure game to a top-down sprite-based RPG is not a terribly significant change for this series because the adventure games already had RPG combat and that the new RPG combat is going to be, you know, active time battle with timed hits, which is what it already was. Right. And then the top-down adventure game is really the same as a, you know, camera-based adventure game. It seems like a huge shift, but it's not. I, I'm really glad to see just the the step back in the qual and the graphics level. I I didn't want to say quality because this isn't certainly a step down in quality by any means. It's just a different thing. So I, I really liked the first two, and I'm hoping that this one will be good too. Cause yep. the they were it was set up from the very beginning that there should be four penny arcade adventures. I think the first thing you see when you boot up the first Penny Arcade's adventure is a poem that's four gods on a windowsill and they're doing whatever. And then, spoilers, you kill one of the gods and then it's three. And then in two, you kill another god and it's two. So, I'm going to go ahead and spoil games that aren't out yet and say that in the third game you'll kill another god and then in the fourth game you'll kill the last god. Spoilers. The last game, I hope you get to kill the final god using a giant fruit fucker. Actually, I think, yeah, you already killed the second god with a giant fruit fucker in two. My statement still remains. <laughs> you just want to do it again. Again, again. Yeah, sounds good to me. So Tycho wrote a text-based follow-up to game two because uh, people were saying that uh, they wanted resolution on the plot. And I was super okay with that. I was actually quite comfortable with him transitioning the story from games to blog posts, except that the first two games had the player character as this, you know, weird everyman who was kind of roped into this because Gabe and Tycho kept destroying her house. And then the text version of the third game did not mention the player character in any capacity, which I was like, hey... She needs to get her house destroyed again and get roped in. And then <laughs> it looks like the game has the player character, so I was like, yes, I'm very yeah, happy about they, this. They appear to have brought back the player character. No, oh, I'm, right. I'm excited about that. So I, I've got one bit of League news, and, and it's not really much. It's just a preview of the upcoming champ, if we could direct to the League site. Um, we weren't given a new character this week because we're still dealing with the release of Lulu, who is changing metas worldwide, because that's a thing. But we also had Earth Day, League of Legends version of April Fools, where, you know, they actually do stuff. So this year we celebrated Earth Day with the release of Fisherman Fizz, who is kind of wearing an old man in the sea uh, get up. Instead of his usual trident spear, he's got a fishing pole with a harpoon on the end. And as his big uh, April Fool's thing, instead of a shark that jumps out of the water, when Fizz uses Chum the Waters, Earth the manatee leaps out and and cries his signature Earth. You have been calling Earth a walrus for days. Manatee. (laughs) I'm aware that this is a manatee, but I hadn't seen the picture up until now, and I'm like, this definitely isn't a walrus. Nope. You That's don't not know a walrus Wilson. is a manatee. <laughs> <laughs> That's a walrus. No, wait, it's a manatee. So yes, it that, may or may not be Jamie Heineman. <laughs> that that was their actual release for Earth Day. Their their joke uh, release was the announcement of League of Legends 3D edition, at the conclusion of which, for the trailer, has Earth leaping out at the camera. Uh, we've also seen the release of Mafia Graves, which is potentially the coolest skin in the game. Yeah, the, this fake 30-second trailer for the League of Legends 3D thing, it it means absolutely nothing. So are either of you familiar with other League of Legends-type games? 
MOBAs, yes, as they're I, called. I actually Dota did clones. a lot of research into the other MOBAs and have come to the conclusion that they are all ridiculously boring compared to League. Really? Um, I was watching and... some Dota 2 videos the other day, and okay, I had my I, mind blown by the I idea of... I can't say of... anything about Dota 2 because it hasn't been officially released yet. It, we're, we're still trying to, to get that together. But the, as far as the ones that are actually out, Heroes of New Earth just doesn't have it. Like, all of the characters seem really <laughs> generic and poorly designed. Well, yeah, that's the point. And then we had Earth. Stacking and pulling blew my mind when I found out about them. And this is something that actually most MOBAs other than League has. And the way it works is that there are jungle minions that you can pull into the back half of your lane to distract your minion wave and prevent them from getting to the center, thereby denying your opposing laner's experience. It's interesting. Super cool. And then, you know, funny, I've seen Heimerdinger do something incredibly similar using his turrets to just block minion progress. That doesn't seem possible. I... Um, th there's a video of a Heimerdinger who managed to block the lane well enough that when he finally allowed the minions to move, it was a wave of several hundred that got loose. Huh. I I'm not sure how exactly he did it. Um, it, it was friendly minions that ended up doing it. And yeah, he he just demolished the opposing side because they couldn't do anything. That would be crazy OP if it was repeatable. I, yeah, I can't imagine I, I how think that would work off the top I'm of my head. I'm pretty sure they have since fixed that. The lane is super wide and the minion pathfinding is pretty good. And you can only place two turrets and they're not that big. Right. I have a feeling back in the day the minions used to stop if they hit an obstruction rather ah. than path around it. Well, that makes sense. And the other it, thing it was a rather old video. A bunch of other MOBAs have is jungle mob stacking. And the way that works is that minions in the jungle will spawn on the minute mark if there's no other previous mobs there, even if the previous mobs from there aren't dead. So what you can do is you have your support go pull those mobs away from their summoning spot, and then... You wait for new mobs to spawn there, and then you let the first set leash, and then there will be two stacks of those mobs in that spot. And right. so when your jungler comes by, your jungler can just smash the lot of them and get a ton of gold and XP real quick. Without that having doesn't to seem like a great tricks. system for balance, though, because that, that really feels like gaming the system in a lot of ways. Uh, it's totally intentional. And I mean, I can see how you could argue that it's weird, but MOBAs are kind of really weird to start with. Right. I mean, nobody could know how MOBAs work if they were just dropped in. Somebody has to explain, okay, this is laning. You put one in the bid, you have, you put two on the sides. Sometimes you put one on a side and there's a jungler. Oh, that's all wacky and crazy. So, right. creep and stacking the, is definitely intentional. The, the actual introduction to League of Legends tells you none of those things. Right. It is a horrible introduction to the game. So I, I guess we should go on to the final bit of news, which was the announcement of a new champ who we have coming soon. And that would be, we scroll down, I want to get this name right. Champion Sneak Peek. Hecarim. I think that's how you pronounce his name. The Shadow of War. separate link. In this. We're not quite sure what he is, but we we have a feeling he's part horse. That that would be the uh, the description here. So the line that I'm specifically pointing at is, uh, it is our opinion that the most epic warriors are themselves at least 50% equine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty horse related. Yep. So we're, we have a feeling centaur, perhaps? And there is a Blue flaming hoof print. Right. In the I, I've yet to figure out what on earth this is. A helmet. Yeah, but whose? I'm trying to figure out Some if that... Some vanquished enemy? I suppose it doesn't have to be related to League. But yes, that would be someone's helmet and broken uh, weapon. It looks like it, the top of the helmet has been caved in, possibly by a hoof. I have a feeling he's going to be armed with a mace. Just saying. Also that he's going to have a blade on his head. 
So we have a... That's not necessarily a head even. That looks like a reflection of this pointy bit here. I don't think so. I have a feeling that is Akarim looking down at whatever's left there. We're talking about an image that we, we will no doubt link. Um, but oh, yeah. yeah. So, should be kind of cool. So if you enjoy leveling your lance, so he uses a lance, I think, is okay. what this implies. <laughs> And charging headlong into the brunt of the enemy ranks, leaving only the trampled corpses of, corpses of lesser foes in your wake. So, again, trampled. So, we're thinking AD with a charge maneuver? So, uses a lance, charges at things. Right. I tried playing Trindamir today. Yeah, this is a bent-up sword that used to belong to this guy, I think. Right. Trindamir's just totally broken. This is news to you. Right. Oh, I'd never played him before. I had been avoiding playing him. And I saw he was because free. people, you know, refer to him as Trendanoob? Yeah. Well, he, he was free today, and I was like, eh, I guess I'll play a bot match with him, because I just want to get my, uh, my winning 200 extra IP. Yeah. He's incredibly stupid. It's like, huh, I think I'm going to dive this turret, and I don't want to die, so, uh, take a couple hits. Ult. Hey, look, I'm immune to death. I'm so cool I don't die when I die. So, I played two other games, actually, that I want to talk about. Yep. Okay. One of which is Microsoft Flight, which is a free-to-play flight simulator, which, once again, has a full thousand gamer score points. Yay. Uh, the first thing I'll say about this is that I opened it up, I downloaded it, and I played it, and, like, five minutes after I opened it, I pulled out my credit card to buy content. And then, I actually didn't buy content, but it, it was really good. He wanted to. I, I was tempted to. Probably it actually does not have the staying power that makes it worth spending money on, but it is a great game to pull out and play for uh, the first 30 minutes and then never play again, because it's free to play, it's only two gigabytes, and it has a really accessible flight simulator tutorial. Uh, I've heard people criticizing it, saying that it's not a great flight simulator because it doesn't have enough crazy twiddly knobs or simulationist aspects, and it's not a good game game because it doesn't have quite as much objective-based uh, narrative stuff, but... Oh, I, that's what you were talking about. So these are the same kind of people who criticize other mech games for not being Steel Battalion? Yes, these are, these are those kind of people. And I can see some merit to that because there are definitely people who spend $500 on gear to set up a cockpit in front of their computer and play yeah, hardcore flight cockpit. simulators. And maybe... This does not cater to them in the way that previous paid Microsoft Flight Simulator games did. And this is the hair to that legacy, so they kind of have a reason to have some expectations. But it, it has a really nice tutorial, and I'd say it is definitely worthwhile to play like 30 minutes of this game for everybody. I got really confused there when you said hair. <laughs> Because I'd always heard it pronounced air, and so I'm imagining, like, H-A-I-R, and I'm like, what on earth is he talking about? Well, it's got a fucking it H after... in it, much like but... herbs. It has a fucking <laughs> H in it. Herbs. Herbs. I, I also now... Herbs. I also now see the Hawaii bit on the advertisement on Steam, and I was like, what is he talking about buying Hawaii? You had sent me a text about this previously. Uh, this, so the main got... menu of this game, when you pull it up, the first option is play game. The second option is buy Hawaii. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> heck yes, thing. I want to buy, buy Hawaii. Hawaii. Then I'll own a whole state. Uh, two senators, like three representatives. I can influence Congress. It'll be great. Yes. No. Okay, and the second game that you Blur picked up? Blur is also five bucks right now, so... The I second game I picked up was one made by Yahtzee of Zero Punctuation fame, called Ooh. Poacher. Okay. It is a Metroidvania where you shoot bunnies with your shotgun. <laughs> Why can I picture Yahtzee making that? Except actually it turns into 
a sort of more crazy Metroidvania like you'd expect. You get infected by a ghost, and then there are giant evil bunny rabbits controlled by squid monsters with telekinetic powers called the Dark Ones. And you have to save the world. It's kind of hard. It's a platformer, and you shoot your shotgun. So what you're telling me is Yahtzee has been spending his ill-gotten gains on lots of drugs lately. <laughs> I don't know that Yahtzee needs drugs to do this, other than maybe alcohol at his bar that he owns. God damn you, Yahtzee. Why do you have he the greatest life? Them. So why do you own two bars and produce wildly successful video content and then make video games in your spare time? And write books. Let's not forget that. Why are you so See, prolific basically... and successful and happy and attractive? Because he's not happy. Oh. Well, I guess there's that. He makes money off of being angry. And hating everything. Don't forget that part. Sort of. He makes money by putting on a show of hating everything, even when he right. actually liked it. It's true. But Poacher is real good. Go play it. Okay, it's then. free. So I'm thinking for next week I totally want us to do a review of Journey, because I keep hearing amazing things. The and issue I'm having scarf. with that is there is no actual way we could do co-op in this game because it's all anonymous. I do not think this is a game that is designed to be played with your friends. The multiplayer right. aspect of Journey is designed to for you to not even know about it before you go in. Because the way it works is sort of that you're just like single player and you're playing your game and then other anonymous Someone people just shows up show up. Desert. And you don't even, you're not even supposed to know that they're not NPCs. And then voice chat is disabled over Xbox Live, so you can't talk to them. You can't send them messages. There's only one in-game communication option, and that's chirping. And it's yep. it's designed for you not to know who you're playing with. So yeah, I, I totally think I want to play this game. But we'll see where next week takes us. I'm looking at some Slashdot articles right now. Maybe with any luck, Pixie can finish uh, Mass Effect, and we can do the final cast about that game. I know, right? We're just dragging this thing out. In my defense... One, I'm on Easter break now. So thankfully, since I go to the lovely Lewis University, which is a Catholic institution, uh, I get all of those holidays off. Holidays in quotation. Uh, no, there was a delay right in the front of there so that I could say frivolous holidays and then we could edit this out later in case that was too offensive. But... Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we might be uh, doing our full final Mass Effect 3 discussion and we'll finally get to talk about the ending. And so I am completely off tomorrow and I've got work Friday morning, but then I have the rest of the day and I'm completely, well, I shouldn't say completely off Saturday because it is Brad's birthday. But. Oh, managed to forget that. Okay. You're not getting him anything, are you? Well, I haven't gotten him anything yet. That doesn't mean I won't get him anything at all. He was he was trying to ask me, like, if you were getting him something so he could decide whether or not he should buy minis, and I was like, I don't know. I'd hold off on that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. So. Because I have no idea. Next week's kind of Hang a crap shoot. We'll hold your horses. We there was a game jam over the weekend based on a Peter Molyneux a parody Twitter account that has crazy ideas like bowling slash survival horror crossovers. Holy crap, this and sounds brilliant. <laughs> it is pretty brilliant. So the way there was a game jam over the weekend, 48 hours, a bunch of people making, you know, semi-professional games. And the bowling slash survival horror game turned out that the bowling ball is your light source and your weapon. So you're in the dark. And you have to bowl down zombies, and you get, like, strikes and spares and points, and you fill up a bowling sheet with it. But also, after you throw your bowling ball, you're in the dark, and zombies are coming at you, so you have to go get your bowling ball so you can see and kill more zombies. And then there's a game based on the tweet about making a game where the tutorial comes up after the credits. And the way that game pans out is that there are these horrible monsters and these coins, and you, you're just dumped right in, and it's a platformer, and obviously you shoot the horrible monsters and you collect the coins. And then when you finish it, it turns out the game actually tells you that the horrible monsters are your friend, and you're supposed to be leading them home by 
pressing a, some button on the keyboard to tell them to follow you. <laughs> and also, the coins are their money, and you're robbing from them. <laughs> you bastard, you're murdering your friends and stealing all their money. Nice. So there's a whole bunch of games like this that you can get at whatwouldmollydo.com, M-O-L-Y-D-E-U-X. Right. And they're based on crazy ideas, and they're hun they're funny. Alright, that's all I got. Alright. Other than I was... Pax East, Angry Birds cartoon, Rock Band Blitz. I'm a little disturbed by the prospects of an Angry Birds cartoon. Yep, an animated cartoon that explores the ri rich, textured fiction of Angry Birds. You know, all the lore of the Angry Birds universe that needs elaborating on. Right, then. Okay. So they're making that. So for this fine April 4th, 2012... Okay, okay. We'll edit that part out. I oh, got yeah. all the effort of pulling up news stories, and then you start talking over me. Well, we've already cleared an hour. Yeah, but I'm sure Rock Band Blitz. Because rhythm games aren't profitable anymore, because they got milked out, um, Harmonix is making a controller-based rock band game that you can play your old rock band DLC with, but it doesn't use any plastic instruments. That sounds and really it boring. does not play... It looks a lot like Audio Surf. I thought the point of playing rock band was... Wait, is this so really a thing or one of the parodies? I'm confused. No, this is a real thing that Harmonix is making as a major commercial product. What? It is an XBLA uh, slash PlayStation Network Wait, what's game. It called? Rock Band Blitz. This is for people who get too embarrassed uh, carrying their, their stupid plastic instruments to their friend's house to play Rock Band. So now they can just I think it actually play. makes a lot of it's sense. Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network. Yep, and it And it does look, like look an, awful awful, an awful lot like Audio Surf. Postscript, I misspoke. Activision owns the Guitar Hero brand, not EA. Carry on. It, the rhythm game genre got milked like crazy when uh, EA and Harmonix were releasing competing games. At one point, EA released five Hero-branded rhythm games in one year. Right. And when those games are like $200 a pop, you burn consumers pretty bad, and then they abandon the genre, so that there's not a lot of money to be made by making actual rock bands at this point. I think this is a good step to revitalize the genre, because people can play their old downloadable content that they paid here's the, for. Here's, here's a couple problems I have with this, looking at this Neoseeker.com article. Um, it, it, it says that, where is it? Uh, your rock band music library is almost fully accessible so you don't almost. get all of them so and there's much... no cooperative play but there will be extensive leaderboards to encourage competition so you lose that getting together with your friends and playing songs together environment that made it such a wildly successful party game yeah i always thought the point of rock band was to get your friends together like i could never see myself standing in my room by myself playing on, on my cheap little plastic guitar or playing the connect that, that was what it is is audio surf for people who don't play PC games. Right. And it's it's a cheap downloadable title. This is not a, a $200 box that comes with a kit of plastic instruments. Mm -hmm. It's $20 and you buy it off the arcade. Yeah, but it seems to be missing the point of Rock Band. No, because people certainly do like audio surf. So if, if someone just wants the experience I, of audio what? surf with their Rock Band songs... But you can do any song on Audio Surf. All of them. Right, but not everybody plays PC games. Right. I mean, there are a lot of people who are, don't have Steam installed anywhere. Yeah. I don't know. They just play games on their Xbox in their living room. There are also a lot of like crazy a... people who refuse to buy anything that doesn't give them a physical copy. Which Audio Surf has none. This doesn't either. Nor does Rock Band Blitz. This is on Xbox Live Arcade or PlayStation. I, I meant specifically for PC. I think most players are okay with the idea of downloading a game through the network. I think it's a good step to revitalize the name when it's been somewhat tarnished. I feel like this kind of does it. It, it lacks the consistency of the brand that it previously had. Yeah, it. I don't think it should be labeled. The only reason it seems to be labeled Rock Band is because you can use the songs that you downloaded through it. And some of them. Some of them. Obviously, they have lost rights to some of these songs. 
All right, you want to discuss your news story picks? Um, just a couple of interesting things. Okay. Let's see. Toronto Police Department used somebody's Facebook profile picture in an online lineup, and somebody was arrested based on that. Okay, so I'm currently picturing the Toronto police getting, like, six real live people, and then some guy to just hold up a Facebook picture of the guy that they actually knew did it, but couldn't prove. Just like, so, was it one of these six gentlemen, or this guy in the picture who's not here because he's probably off stealing your dog? It's the picture guy. Really, that just feels like the girl who was assaulted at the at this bar uh, pointed you out as being her assaulter through a photo on Facebook. So yeah, <laughs> this person was arrested based on that. That's not really a lineup, though. Like the way I was picturing it, it's a lot worse. No, even better, they get six people and they all just hold the photo of this guy up over their faces. How do you know it's not a woman? In fact, it looks like it. Yeah, Liz Aston. All right, then. So, stop being sexist, son. <laughs> Women commit violent crimes, too. <laughs> I don't think that's something to be proud of for your gender. <laughs> that's not really a question of pride. It's a question of when you treat people in a certain way, their behavior changes. Uh, if you treat men as being the source of all violence, then maybe they tend to be more violent. It's also a question of being realistic about the way the world works. Uh, if, you, if you say things, you generally just kind of want them to be true. Although, our language is structured to make it very hard to talk about things without making assumptions about gender. Right. We've got, much we've got, if our language we've got the singular they. We kind of do. Yes, I know you and I have had this. All right, moving on. Next story. Many a time. Um... Yahoo started laying off people today. Uh, over 2,000 people, that's about 14% of the company's total workforce, got laid off this morning. I didn't realize Yahoo had that many employees. This morning, they all lost their jobs. So wait, 2,000 employees was about 14% of their workforce. Yes. So... They say it's in an effort to slim down and pivot its focus in a new direction. Yahoo had over 10,000 employees? Yes. Really? Okay. What What the hell are they all doing? I'm sorry, I don't know a Yahoo single... Yahoo has emails, they've got their like news page, they've got columnists... But realistically, got... I don't know a single person who navigates to Yahoo first in their daily life. That's my dad's uh, probably homepage. Probably mostly it's dumb people. This is my dad's homepage. <laughs> It's people who, not necessarily dumb people, but there's lots of software installers that will install the Yahoo bar and you set your homepage to Yahoo I'm, if you don't I'm, uncheck checkboxes. I'm not saying anything and about then, your father's tech savviness, but damn. <laughs> yeah, this right here is what he sees every time he starts his web browser. You know, it could be worse. I think my dad's browser still navigates to AOL first. That's pretty bad. Likewise, my 360 account is currently registered onto an AOL just because that's how long ago I made it. I'm not sure that's an excuse. I'm not sure Xbox Live was around when X when AOL was still popular. Uh, I think it was just dying out when the 360 was released. This, um, this layoff today was the sixth one in four years. And under three different CEOs that Yahoo has... Okay, so... Sloughed some employees. Downside. I don't think anybody's thinking the long-term prospects this is for the biggest, Yahoo are terribly good. This is the biggest good. one, yeah, and the no. second biggest one came in 2008 when they laid off 1,500 people. Yeah. During the recession. It's a bad sign when your company's layoffs are in the thousands. Yeah. Don't look good for them. Well, back in the day, they had, you know, they, they had their Yahoo search and... They still have those. They are done yes. programming those. Uh, what I'm saying is that that was what they used to be known for. Cause... Right, that and the, the stupid yodeling commercial. I get it. But now they've got all of this stuff is what their employees are doing. 
from the news articles and um apparently we're stuff. writing about dead high school students and scarlett johansson not wearing clothing <laughs> clearly both equally as important news videos so they're filming about it and sting's <laughs> wife doesn't look old <laughs> the hell yahoo I I all I always think that this trending now my, section is hilarious. My condolences to the people who, um, who got laid off. But damn, if that's the top of your headlines, really. Yep. So I see this on a fairly regular basis. Anyone got anything Notch else? of Minecraft fame has announced his plans for his next game, and they are crazy wacko crazy. Like, crazy fun or crazy, like, actually crazy? Crazy, I don't think this is going to work, sir. Crazy, like, super weird. I mean, I'm but, not going to say it won't work, even though it kind of seems like it won't or... work. This is called 0x10C, and it's based in space in the year 281-474-976-712-644 AD, and... You play the game by programming a CPU in assembly language? You know, we are it... talking about the guy who did make one of the highest selling indie games of all time on the premise, yeah, you play with blocks. Well, this claims to be very hard science fiction with extreme realism. And it sounds crazy, crazy. And I'm I'm totally gonna try it out, especially since I am already deep in the craziness that it embraces, which is you know computer science. But I don't know. Seems freaky. Yep. I'm afraid. Um. Let's see. This is interesting. A federal court has thrown out a 2010 Colorado law uh, that was meant to make. Online retailers collect state sales tax. Yep. And so the... According to U.S. District Judge Robert Blackburn, um, the law and the rules to carry it out, quote, impose an undue burden on interstate commerce and are unconstitutional. Yeah, this would be part of the fact that um, Amazon.com is one of the largest businesses in California, mm. and yet because they do all of their business online, they pay a fraction of the taxes that other businesses do. This seems like sort of a surprising decision to me, and I'm not sure how long it's going to last. I almost feel like this is going to get turned over in a slightly different case that comes to the Supreme Court relatively soon. The history of Amazon boycotting... Uh -oh. Lost a pyro. It was just a second. And... And we're back. Man. There we go. This okay. kind of sucks. Right. The history of Amazon boycotting state sales tax is that it has had warehouses in a bunch of states, and then the states are like, okay, well, you do business here because you have these warehouses and these shipping operations, so we're going to impose sales tax on you. And then Amazon is like, no, uh And so they close down their warehouses and fire all their employees in that state. And the state is like, oh, well, that didn't work out the way I had hoped. Um, and they've done this over and over in a lot of states, but California is sort of where push came to shove, because... That's, that's their that's, headquarters? Oh, uh, Colorado is the one specifically mentioned being struck down in this article. Uh, I've also noticed from links from this article outward that show that I guess they were pushing for a while for the federal government to step in and create a national internet sales tax, basically. Right. So that way they don't have to deal with all the hopping around. The problem with well, that, that comes from the fact that you don't know what states get to charge. Is it the state where the item is being received? Is it the state where the item is departing from? Mm -hmm. What do you do for foreign items then? I think the way it works in Illinois is the state that the item is departing from. That's the way it's but, supposed to work. Illinois actually doesn't have an online sales tax. I'm pretty sure we do because uh, that guy with the glasses, is, the Channel Awesome store is based here in Illinois. They have one. 
Hmm. Interesting. That is what I was basing that off of. The way most states do their sales tax is actually Remember, that I got if, the, one of the DVDs for your girlfriend one, uh, one right. birthday. If a citizen of a state buys something online and the online store does not charge any sales tax, the citizen is supposed to report that purchase on their personal tax returns and pay the sales tax rate on that purchase for their state to their state government. I see. Uh, but nobody does that, and it's completely unenforceable because the state government cannot logistically keep track of every private purchase you make. Right. And so having a national internet sales tax kind of makes sense in just a matter of reducing the paperwork of figuring out what rate to charge for taxes, but it, the burden on the federal government is then to decide who gets that money. And if that money goes to the federal government, that kind of doesn't make any sense. Well, or at least the states would not be terribly happy about it because it leaves the state governments with a lot of revenue missing. So yeah, I'm, I would not be surprised if this decision is impacted by another decision and winds up being something different relatively soon. It seems like a weird decision to me. Yep. So yeah. Anything else? Uh, Suda51 announced his next game, which is called Killer is Dead. Which sounds like another ah, Suda51 here game. Go. Here we go. I've got this. I've got this on taxes. I will. I, I swear this will be the last thing we say on taxes. Um, only Illinois residents are charged taxes from the um, Channel Awesome internet store. Uh, since we are based out of Illinois, we must charge tax to all Illinois residents. That's what it says there. Right. And so... That actually answers nothing, actually, now that I think about no, it. absolutely not. No, nominally, if you're living in Georgia and you purchase from the Channel Awesome store, you don't what pay. you should do is report that and pay Georgia tax rates to Georgia's government on your personal tax return for that purchase. But I guess since you're in Illinois and that. they're in Illinois, it, you would just pay it to them and they would pay the taxes to the state? Is right. that how that works? And then they turn that tax money over to the state in one big lump sum. Okay. And uh, now I get this. All right, sorry. I just I had information. I so I'd provided Suda Fifty One survives the release of Lollipop Chainsaw, he will be making another game. Uh huh. That's uh, kind of a big if, but um, <laughs> we're reviewing it. We're doing an extended let's play review of that game. Uh, I gotta get all that recording stuff out and figure out the delay. <laughs> Editing, that's going to be such a pain for Pyro. <laughs> totally that's worth it, though. <laughs> Pyro is willing to take the hit on this one. Uh, I, I actually know people who are unironically looking forward to this game, and it makes me die a little bit inside. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of information about Killer is Dead, but the thing I like, the reason I wanted to report on this is basically just because the Giant Bomb article about Killer is Dead has a picture in it captioned, In the absence of any Killer is Dead assets, here is my favorite picture of Suda51 on a toilet. <laughs> Surprisingly, there are several to choose from. Well, of course, because sitting on the toilet was the saving method in uh, No More Heroes. Yep. Well, lots of pictures of Suda51 sitting on toilets. Nice. Alright, we've gone real long, so yeah, maybe we, we should wrap it up. Right, so, for this fine April 4th, 2012, this has been Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. <laughs>